Hello. Good morning, Lee. How are you? Good, thank you. Are you all ready? I think so. For the new you? Right. New lips? Mm -hmm. For women who are prepared to undergo surgery to improve their looks, it's possible to artificially enlarge their lips to give them a permanently sexy, pouting mouth. This procedure, which involves inserting strips of fat into the flesh of the lips, may be far less dramatic than the insertion of enormous lip plates, but the basic idea is the same. Bigger lips are sexier lips. Face on, the upper lip increased by three and a half millimeters, the lower lip increased by five millimeters. Well, now what we do is you lick your lips and we can stick you to a window. <laughs> was, this a, was it as difficult as you thought it would no, be? No, it was nothing for me. Did it take the full two hours? No. No? Did you get him to do the PR? Mm-hmm. I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought it'd be like, uh, the way he was explaining it, like a giant sea bass or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not as bad as I expected. Beautiful. You think so already, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> All ready to go? I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Much of the human female's sex appeal is related to her ability to bear children. Wide hips and a supple abdomen give promise of easy childbirth, and body movements that emphasize these qualities transmit powerful sexual signals to watching male eyes. This is the basis of the famous Turkish belly dance, performed here not as a flashy nightclub act for tourists, but as the real thing, an erotic display by Turks for Turks. In Cameroon, in tropical West Africa, where the breeding rate is high, in fact three times as high as in North America or Europe, the ability to bear children is an even more important element of female sex appeal. So it's hardly surprising that the devices local women use to signal their breeding potential are even more exaggerated. If a large pelvis is good for giving birth, then why not help nature out by creating a super pelvis? These women are preparing for an evening out on the town by padding their skirts with cushions to give the impression that their hips are massively wide and therefore perfect for the easiest of childbirths. The results may look clumsily heavy to western eyes, but to the local males, these swollen contours are the height of female sexuality. If a wife is expected to have at least six children, as she is in this particular country, then these are the broad pelvic girdles through which those new babies will slide into the world with consummate ease. An alternative way to emphasize the hips is to artificially reduce the width of the waist. In earlier epochs, this was done by squeezing the female body into corsets that were so tight the women could hardly breathe. At the height of the Victorian period, some women even had their lower ribs surgically removed to create the perfect hourglass figure. The next one I want to talk about is this one. So, In the West today, however, where the breeding rate has slowed down dramatically, the preference is for a slimmer, more juvenile figure. The ideal female is no longer the voluptuous, heavy-hipped child-bearer, but the more lively, playful companion. This more slender figure needs a little help with its primeval sexual signals and finds it in a new kind of garment. Did you notice any difference in your shape? Well, other people did. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bum bra, designed to control and shape the buttocks, giving the wearer a silhouette which reinstates the sexuality of the female behind, while retaining the minimum of body fat as required by contemporary fashion. Actually, but I'm just concerned that we need to perhaps lower this mm. yeah. just a fraction. I think it just needs to tuck yeah. underneath your bottom a little mm. bit more there, mm. give you just that yeah mm -hmm. okay right. that's great right. thanks very much can you put the next garment on now please? yes all right
Generous hips may not be popular in the West, but generous breasts are still in favour. Because the hemispherical shape of the female breast is such a powerful sexual signal for our species, it's not surprising to find that some women resort to surgery to enhance this feature. This creates a powerful image for spectators, but whether these visually improved breasts feel sexual is another matter. In the context of the topless bar, however, this is of no importance, because here, touching is strictly taboo. Even for those physical features where no gender differences exist, culture soon invents them. There's no biological difference, for example, between the hair that grows on the top of the head of a young adult male and that on a young adult female. Before male baldness sets in in later life, the head hair is identical in the two sexes, providing it's left alone and allowed to grow naturally. But there is hardly a human society on earth where it gets this chance. Hairstylists are everywhere. Male hairstyles are generally shorter and simpler than those of females. This difference dates back to ancient Rome, when the Roman army cropped its hair. Cropped hair is more difficult to grab hold of in close combat. Long hair makes the wearer more vulnerable. Ever since then, a shorter hairstyle has been thought of as essentially masculine, and the more elaborate hairstyles as feminine. Societies the world over have adopted hair as a conveniently conspicuous gender signalling device. In India, where traditionally women wear their hair very long and therefore super feminine, a girl who chooses to cut her hair short is making a strong statement about herself. I'm modern, I'm independent, I'm liberated. It may have taken her years to grow her beautiful hair to this length, but now it's time for a more severe, business-like approach to life. In the West, however, where hairstyles today are highly variable and long hair is therefore not burdened with a traditional standard, its sexual appeal can be freely enjoyed by women without robbing them of their liberated image. This has led to ingenious ways of making women's hair appear longer, one of which is to have lengths of natural hair attached to the existing short hair. So, as hair is chopped ruthlessly off in the East, it's stuck delicately on in the West. In a procedure lasting anything up to four hours, specially developed glue binds the strands of human hair in place, but the effect is only temporary and will last around three months. It follows that for every person who's had their hair extended in this way, someone with long hair has chosen to make a different statement by cutting theirs short. And the significance of culture in this reciprocal arrangement is reflected by the fact that the trade in human hair is all one way. India and China are the main exporters, and the West is the only market. One of the qualities of longer female hair is that it's much softer and more sensuous to the touch than closely cropped male hair. This has led many societies to create a taboo against its overt display. In some cultures, the taboo has been total. No public display of female hair at any time. In others, the taboo is partial, applied only in sacred contexts. Here in St. Petersburg, the traditionally long-haired Russian women entering this Russian Orthodox church are required to cover their hair as an act of humility, although the traditionally short-haired men face no such restriction. Gender signals, even those artificially created by society, can become so potent that they have to be suppressed in non-sexual contexts. <laughs> 